Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, a podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival, known as TIFF, and artistic director of New York's documentary festival, Doc NYC. We've been on hiatus for a few weeks. In May, I was at the Cannes Film Festival, serving on the GoldenEye documentary jury. Our top prize went to the film Faces Places, that's a collaboration between Agnes Varda and the street artist JR. Watch out for its release in the fall. Then I returned home to face my busiest season of the year as the TIFF programming team deliberates over hundreds of films to make our choices for the September festival. On top of that, I wanted to pick something special for our 50th episode, and here you have it. D.A. Pennebaker's film, Monterey Pop, is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Criterion and Janus Films have released a new restoration in 4K that looks and sounds fantastic. Pennebaker captured the landmark 1967 concert in California that kicked off the Summer of Love. The event assembled an eclectic mix from the music scenes of San Francisco, Los Angeles, Memphis, London, and more. In the early 60s, Pennebaker was among the pioneers of American documentary, along with Robert Drew, Richard Leacock, and Albert Mazels. They had crafted cameras that allowed for handheld shooting with synchronous sound. Pennebaker had a breakthrough with his 1967 film on Bob Dylan, Don't Look Back. Come gather round people wherever you roam. And admit that the waters around you have grown And accept that that soon you'll be drenched to the bone If your time to you is worth saving Then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times, they are a-changing That film's reputation must have impressed the Mamas and the Papas singer John Phillips and record producer Lou Adler who set out to produce a film about the Monterey concert. They hired Pennebaker, who brought a crew of six cameramen shooting on 16 millimeter. Sound was recorded on a state-of-the-art eight-channel system. The film captures performances by Otis Redding, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, The Who, Ravi Shankar, and others. They are as riveting today as when audiences were seeing them for the first time. Pennebaker laid the path for concert films that would continue with Woodstock, Gimme Shelter, and Watt Stacks. Last week, I hosted a screening of Monterey Pop at New York's IFC Center. Afterwards, Pennebaker and two of the camera crew, Jim Desmond and Nick Proferis, joined me for a conversation in front of a live audience. Pennebaker gets it started. The thing that, that was fantastic about this event and about the film that, was, that we made out of it was those people in it they were all gone. Otis, Jimmy, uh, Janice. I mean, when you think, you're looking at history, uh, the kind that makes everybody cry because it's gone and it'll never come back. And, you know, I, 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 when I, I was watching it and I was thinking, being on stage behind Janice and watching her butt sail into that song, uh, you know, I, it still gets me. It makes me just, uh, I, I, I knew I was in the right place and that this was the right thing happening in front of us. So it was like, I didn't know where to go from there, but I knew we were right. So, Penny, can you describe where you were in your career when you got asked to make this film? Broke. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But, you know, 
filmmakers got used to being broke. And they, we all cons consoled each other in, in various village bars. But the fact is that I was really happy. And after this film, I thought, shit, this is fantastic. But from then on, everybody kind of knew what I could do or what could happen if we were lucky. And they all were on my side. Jim, can you describe for me what you thought of this project when you first heard it, what, what this opportunity meant for you to be a part of? I don't think you think about it as an opportunity. We were, we were all just uh, neophytes here. Nick and I were cleaning uh, magazines out for him, shooting, uh, learning how to shoot with those cameras. And so there wasn't any, uh, there wasn't any of that going on, I don't think. Uh, we, were, we, were, we were in it to find out what what we were doing. We, we, we didn't know anything about this. We all loved, Penny and I had sort of jazz backgrounds and uh, and and uh, I listened to all the doo-wop stuff in high school and loved that. And I loved music. My father was, was a big music fan. And, um, and I, th I think the music is the thing that got me interested in anything, uh, uh, making films especially through Penny, because Penny is the guy who set the tone for the way these films are, basically. So uh, Nick uh, Pennebaker at that time was uh, in partnership with Richard Leacock, and we all, I, I believe Albert Mazels was part of this crew. These are names who, in documentary history, mean a lot to us uh, today. I wonder what those names meant to you at the time, if anything. Oh, I had just come out of the post office. What? I didn't know Penny Baker. I didn't know Cinema Verite. Uh, uh, Penny saved my life. I told him earlier tonight by giving me a job. Uh, and after five years or so, he handed me a camera one day up in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Remember that, Penny Baker? We were shooting snow tire commercials. Snow, he says, snow hey, tires, right. Oh, snow car. tires, yeah. We had to work for our living. Yeah, Bob Eggers. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I was very honored when Penny asked me to, Jim and I, we were partners and we had our own company, to shoot uh, this thing. Uh, but I didn't know what it was because I wasn't familiar with any of the music. I was very square. And, <laughs> and uh, being uh, right on the stage, just below the stage, with these huge uh, speakers and Otis and Janice and Jimmy and Mamas and the Papas and everybody there, it was transformative for me. Penny, let me ask you what the music meant to you because you're gonna turn 92 in a month. Uh, so 50 years ago, you were already in your 40s uh, and you're, now you're, you're documenting this generation that's saying about I hope I die before I get old. Uh, uh, what, what did you know? What was your relationship to to the young people there? I always felt I was the youngest person in the room, and I still do. I still do. I, I can't explain that any further, it, unless I had a psychiatrist who wanted to listen free. But uh, no, the thing was that I had grown up in Chicago, and the music there was exploding among all the, the white kids that I knew. I didn't know, I knew one black kid. But the, it was exploding because the record had been invented. And suddenly you could hear Louis Armstrong and Joe Oliver and, uh, and, 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 and uh, people that otherwise were just names. I mean, you, the, the, bar, the, the places they played were run by the, the gangsters. And for a ten, I was 10 years old anyway, so th there was no way I was going to see anybody. I had no idea what any of them looked like. But those records, those records were like a, a, a glimpse into some future that I had never imagined. And it still is. I still have, I mean, I remember buying a couple of, a bunch of records, one of which was a Louis Armstrong Dallas Blues. <laughs> I didn't even have a thing to play them on, but I knew they were valuable. 
and, and when I got a, a, a Victrola for my birthday, I could start playing and listen to some of this stuff. And it, it just, I'll tell you, I thought music is going to save the world. So when I got to this point in my life where, where I was hanging out with, 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 with Dylan and uh, it was like it was a, what was happening was that the music that I started with was sort of spaced out with the kind of music you heard in, in, in Broadway shows, which is said, we're all having a good time. You know, we're all, we've got some money and we're all having a good time. And suddenly I was coming into a kind of music that was that I heard in in Monterey but I'd been hearing a little bit with 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 John Phillips and Michelle which said look out it's it's going to be different and I kind of that kind of fascinated me but of course when I I, I would put on when I go home I'd put on a a, a 78 record and listen to uh uh, a Joe Oliver uh, play something. So it was like the the world was changing and I would be, I was in a position, I was going to be lucky enough to watch it. And that's what the camera was for me, a way to watch it. And, and, and I, you know, I, I was a pretty good watcher. I, why I don't know, but I've always been, uh, I, I tell people that it, it, like the, in Alien, when the guys go looking for his cat in the rocket ship, and the creature is still loose, and he's about, he's saying, here, kitty, kitty, and the cat's just looking at him, and the creature is just about to eat him up, and the cat just watches. That's what we do. <laughs> if I didn't tell her, Jim Desmond speaks about the eight-channel recording equipment. The sound was so incredible. It separated everybody's voice. When, when uh, Mama Cass comes on there, I didn't, I, she was lead singing uh, California Dreamin', and, and I had never heard it before like that. The sound was spectacular. And and, uh, and the film, uh, one of my weak points in, in shooting was look, having to look at that great close-up of Janice, which I thought was wonderful that I shot. And it was, we shot, we put the, lo- or the wrong, we had the wrong uh, f-stops on all the cameras. So, because we had said it's going to be dusk or something, or, or yeah, so we opened it up a little more, and it overexposed everything. So Janice's hair was green, her skin was all green, and this print is amazing. Yeah, it's-, it's just amazing. So when you get those two elements of, some, of something that's shot really so casually with that spectacular technological stuff in it, holding the sound together and making it so much more, it was so much like it was there. And the picture was beautiful. So God, whoever, whoever the criterion, God bless you, boy. You guys, you, you, make, the, you make the best films, you know, come back alive, really. Criterion was a fantastic job. The problem that you have when you're making this kind of film is that you have a, a magazine loaded with film in the morning and you go out and you shoot something in nice bright light and it looks great and then you go in you go, go and you still have half a roll in the in the camera and you go in and, play, and it's suddenly a room and it's got no light or very little light uh, well you're not going to change the film i mean we, we were guarding every foot of film we had so the what you do is what i did was i i i oh, every f- f- when we process the film Everything was bumped, one stop. So you're taking a chance because some stuff is going to, be going to be overloaded. But but there's one shot that I always use as my test 
to see if it's going to be an okay print. And it's a girl, it, she's just sitting and she stands up and she has a red sort of jacket on, or a red cloak. And that red is so fantastic. Every time I see it, it makes me jump out of my seat. And so I, when, I, when I jump out of my seat, I know it's a good print. <laughs> Penny Baker, in, in, in that time period, a lot of people were taking uh, substances at uh, so I heard at concerts. Did that uh, affect the film crew at all? Uh, y y be my guest. <laughs> no, we, we didn't have time for that. We were so too busy uh, getting our cameras uh, cleaned and, and the lenses. We had to, every morning we had to, uh, uh, there was a problem that sometimes with seating uh, lenses that they're not, that you won't get a sharp image. So you have to, you have to do a whole process of, of testing and making sure it's tight on where it's supposed to be. So I, we didn't really have a lot of time for, for, uh, for, for, for drug enthusiasm. But at the, at least at, I didn't. At I the end of the day, you were so pooped from working <laughs> like that. I mean, Nick and I were shooting, uh, there's one, uh, there's a picture out there in the, in the lounge of Nick's camera with the big, it was a, a half hour load of film. 1,200 foot. 1,200 feet, uh, and, and so we, we could shoot one, a half hour straight, and the other cameras were about 10, 10 minutes. So uh, we were exhausted at the end of the day. We had, we had to go uh, take care of all the camera, all the gear and all that stuff, get it out of there, because it was misty and wet all the time out at Monterey, and, uh, and then try and get some sleep and uh, eat something other than the junk on the midway. And, uh, and so there wasn't a lot of drug taken, I'll tell you. Penny, a few minutes ago we were talking about editing, and I wanted to ask you about the editor, Nina Schulman, who passed away a few yeah, years ago. Yeah. Can you talk about working with her, and, and what were the decisions that you had to make in the edit room to shrink down this three-day concert to 79 minutes? She had come into my office one day and, uh, and started to work. I don't even know if I hired her. Uh, but I never knew whether I'd hired anybody. Yeah, everybody just came and and did whatever they wanted, and uh, she uh, uh, she was terrific. We, we really all loved her. She was very I don't know. She just got along with everybody. So when we went out there, we took her along. I didn't really. I thought. I mean, I didn't understand how to make this film at all when I went out. So I thought it would be like other, a few other films I'd made where I'd pretty much done them myself. I, I would be the cameraman and then I'd put the camera away and, and go in and, make, and edit it and put it all together. And then I would try to mix it or get it, whatever the tracks were, and put them on. I mean, it was all a little process that you did step by step. And I thought, you know, she was terrific at, at, at well, having, helping people make those steps. So she became the editor. And, and we, we took that part picture uh, out behind the motel. Uh, and she was, the, she was sort of the center of the crew because she was the only girl. And I, I, and I look back on it now, I think we, we probably should have had more girls, but there weren't more girls. There was only, uh, she was the only one around that we knew. And so she became our editor all the time. I've been loving you Oh, too long And I don't want to stop now When Otis Redding sings, I've been loving you too long, Pennebaker is filming from behind. The intense spotlight on Redding frames him in a silhouette with a kind of halo. And as the singer moves his head to the music, the spotlight hits the camera like a strobe. Six months later, Redding was killed in a plane crash at the age of 26. I was trying to explain. The fact is that I was editing that sequence just by chance 
when, when Otis went into the lake, the pilot thought it was a field he was going to land on or something. And uh, uh, one guy survived the crash, ben but Cawley. not Otis. Ben like, Cauley was a the saxophone trumpet player. Yeah, yeah trumpet player. Uh, anyway, um, when, when I was behind him, that all was happening because of the, 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 the lime, whatever they call them, the lights, the, uh, were, were, you know, he was ducking under it and I couldn't really control it much. I couldn't move faster than he did. And, uh, but I, later when I saw it, I thought, well, we'll just have to, I'll just have to cut it out. But then while I was, and I heard that he, he was killed, that he was dead, and I was sort of in the middle of that sequence, I thought, maybe I should just leave it the way it is. And so I did. And uh, I take my humps as, as time goes by. I, it doesn't bother me so much now, but at the time I thought, Jesus, you know, what are people going to think when they see this in the theater? But, you know, at the time, we didn't even know we were going to be able to get it into a theater. We had uh, it was supposed to be ABC was going to pay for it, and, and ABC turned it down. They didn't like Hendri Jimi Hendrix uh, uh, <laughs> humping the guitars, you know. <laughs> so so it, it, it turned out it was a couple of years before they had to buy it as a feature film. But at the time, we weren't sure how the hell we were going to even finish it. And Lou sent me a note saying that somebody had run off with all the money, whatever money they had made. And that, uh, so he couldn't pay us anything for the processing. So we had to go through a long extended period with some lawyers I'd graduated from college with uh, who helped us. Well, with, with Lou's lawyers, we arranged, we had, we had to figure out a way to own the film, uh, which we didn't normally. Normally, that would, would have belonged to uh, Lou Adler and, and I guess the Mamas and the Papas. But in, in fact, uh, we, we, we had to figure out how to get it so we owned it, and then we could raise the money. And it was, the labs were terrific. They were very helpful. They, they let me own that money for two or three years. But it, 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 when everybody saw the film, they said, you know, whatever it takes, we'll help you do it. We came back from there uh, to a series of programmed rushes, 24-hour-a-day rushes. And everybody I, I ever heard of in my life, every musician came to see those, including Ravi Shankar, came and, and sat there smoking their toques and stuff and watching the rushes for this film. So after about a week of that, I had this incredible sense that this was, uh, you know, this was a film that a lot of people were going to really get into. I mean, I, I wanted it not to be, a lot of times people make films about uh, you know, when they make a movies, home movies uh, called documentaries, uh, and they, they make them with the, with the idea that they'll also put in a little sociology and interview people who smoke dope and ask them why and, 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 and various things that, uh, that, that seem important to our general uh, education. And I wanted this film to be like a record player. You just... When a record was finished, you took it off and put another one on. And it was just straight music. There was nothing in between. And if anybody wanted to interrupt it, that was their business. I wasn't going to stop them, but I wasn't going to ask them to interrupt. So it kind of turned out that way because what I had was five <laughs> cameramen who every morning we would eat in this waffle waffle <laughs> place. It was this terrible place. but. <laughs> And, and everybody would get their five or six rolls, whatever we had allotted, and I wouldn't see them till nightfall, and I'd have no idea what they did. Uh, we, we had some set places where people, so we'd know that we get, were covering people who were on, performing on stage, but how they shot and what they shot uh, was kind of their business. So those rushes were fantastic things for me to go to. I saw a whole movie there, and it was, I'll never forget it. I'll never get over that sense of what we'd accomplished, not me directing a film, but six people directing the film. And that was wonderful. And I don't want someone that can tell me, come on! Or tell me why! Or tell me why! Oh, people, tell me why love! Honey, why love is luck? 
Well, it's like a ball and in a chain. There's a fascinating anecdote I heard about Janis Joplin in this film and that she almost didn't appear in this film. She was in the concert. Can you tell that story? Uh, yeah. When, when I'd never heard her before. I never. I. I think maybe I've heard the, one of her records, but I can't remember now. But the uh, one of the first. She was one of the first people to, to sing. I don't know. And when I heard her, I was uh, the guy had said, "You can't film this. She's not." We're, we're, uh, this was her manager, who was not going to let her uh, be in the in the film. And I snuck a few shots of her because I said, "Shit." She's got to be in the film. There's no film if she isn't in it. Because I never heard anybody bring that kind of energy that I, I you know, it's like Bessie Smith suddenly appearing in, in front of us and somebody saying, you can't film her. So I said to Albert Grossman, who was out there, he had a, a guy from Canada that he had down out there do it. And I said, Albert, whatever it takes, can you go talk to the manager and maybe break his leg or something? Uh, but we got to have her in the film. And so that afternoon she came running back and said, I'm going to do the whole set over again and you guys can film it. And that was such a, a fantastic kind of sense that there was no way we could stop this, this concert or this film from working, that it was just gonna happen. And I remember sitting on the stage afterwards, after she, her, her, her thing that she did, and I think there were three or four of us sitting there with our legs hanging over the stage, and everybody kind of left. And we were saying, what's, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Uh, Janice, what's gonna happen to you in the next couple of years? Will you be back here? And people were trying to sort of get out of the lives they were in and get into some life that they wanted to imagine. And I still remember it was, it had no, there was no music playing, but in my head I could hear, I could hear just some of the wonderful, uh, like Dallas blues. I could hear Louis saying, got the Dallas blues Main Street on my mind. I could hear that sense of loss that you have when, you, when, you're, when, you, when you're growing up that fast, which she had to. of Monterey Pop is a transfixing performance by the Bengali sitar player Ravi Shankar. Here's Penna Baker. But you know when when uh, Ravi did his uh, his act, he he stood up and he asked everybody. I, I forget how I didn't hear the thing. We have it recorded somewhere, but he asked everybody not to smoke, and he meant really not to smoke, nothing, uh, just sit there and listen. And uh, and as far as I know, everybody from Los Angeles to, to San Francisco, didn't smoke. I mean, I, 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 I saw a few people somewhat sleepy out there, so I assume they had, had had some smoking going on in their lives at some time earlier, but uh, he, 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 he turned that audience into music lovers. He did something, and it was so amazing to stand there and watch it uh, and I sometimes think that that audience clapping is too much of it at the end. We should probably cut it. But uh, when I went to do it, Truman Capote said, don't cut it. It's, 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 you've filmed an ovation. I can remember him saying that in his little creaky voice. <laughs> Nick, when you watched tonight, what were the things that stood out to you? Uh, where did the 50 years go? <laughs> uh, yeah. I remember coming back to the motel uh, one night, and there was this telegram from my wife uh, that uh, my son uh, had just had, had his first tooth, and my son now is 50. Uh, 
So, but what stood out to me is 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 the, it's 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 not corny to say that it's spiritual in nature. That that the music did transform me. I hadn't heard it. The 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 uh, celebration of life. Then re ending with the uh, Rabbi Rabbi Shankar. Uh, Looking at him through the long lens, which was most, I was mostly at, uh, at the extension of the 120 millimeter lens, and with the music, that was a drug. And, and it wasn't just, it was on for a whole afternoon. I think he went for three hours. Yeah, it was a long thing. It was a very long, and, and so that was, I had never experienced anything like that in my life. Uh, so, I was a changed person. Uh, I guess I was about 30 then. And um, yeah, I was different. Jim Desmond describes the challenges he and Nick Proferis had while filming Shankar's performance. Well, the Ravi Shankar uh, is, is about an hour long or something, the whole raga. And John Cook uh, was working sound doing for sound us, for me. doing sound for Penny. Um, he knew the raga, and he said, OK, uh, I, uh, how much film have you got left? We, and now I was only shooting 10-minute uh, loads. Every, we, oh, that's all I had left, everybody. We had one load in their camera because we were just out. We saved one, I think, for Tiny Tim that, later. But I don't think anybody's seen that. Anyway, so, so John Cook, uh, we had this stick with a red light on it. And uh, so when it got to the point that John knew, he said, eh, 10 minutes, uh, he hit the light. And uh, we all shot the uh, what you see, what that that length of time, and uh, I, I I'm sure this is just a, a novelistic idea, but I think I heard the film go th 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 in my magazine right when the thing was over, when the rock was over. But I, I think I'll put that in a novel. Not I don't think it's real. <laughs> no, we were very close at the end. Yeah, we were real close. But you know. The thing is, I was wandering around watching people sell, uh, you know, pet stones to people. And the whole goofy as it goes on in, a, in, a, in music festivals where, where drugs are not far away. And uh, I was listening to that music and I thought, Jesus, it's fantastic. We weren't even sure that it was going to, that uh, we'd have Ravi Shankar in the film because who'd heard of him? We didn't. You know, who'd heard the music? Who knew, who knew anything about it? So I was listening to it and I thought, Jesus, it really sounds pretty good. I'd better go down and see what they're doing and if they need any help. So I went down uh, to the, to the front of the stage where they were, where it was all coming from. And uh, uh, the two of them were just, they were right on top of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the music. And they, they couldn't have been more than five feet from, from either of, their, the, the, of the guys playing. And I thought, they don't need any help at all. So I, I just filmed the front row of the audience. And, the, and I was looking for the person who I thought would be the most excited when it ended. And I got her, that girl that jumps up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so in a way, it was kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the fact is that we way overshot. We, when, when, when Hendrix started to, to play, I think everybody everybody shot and didn't pay any attention to the red light, and so that we shot almost everything he did. And the same with the Who, the same with everybody. So that we were running out of film, and I thought this is no way to make a movie. But you know, when I saw those rushes, I thought it's the only way to make a movie. I want to thank D.A. Pennebaker, Jim Desmond, and Nick Perferis for speaking with me. Monterey Pop is now touring in theaters from Janus Films. 
Criterion has a deluxe DVD and Blu-ray set that includes additional footage of Otis Redding, Jimi Hendrix, and more. Last year, I did another interview with D.A. Pennebaker and Chris Hegedus that you can hear on Pure Nonfiction number 9. They talk about their films on feminism, David Bowie, Bill Clinton, and animal rights. Now that we've hit 50, we have some changes at Pure Nonfiction. Our series producer, Michael Scotty Jr., who has been with me from the start, recently got married and is moving to Los Angeles. Our longtime sound mixer, Kyle Murphy, is shifting his focus to other projects. I've had a great time working with them both and look forward to roping them back in. This summer, we're taking a break from our weekly schedule, but we hope to release an occasional episode. Then in the fall, we'll start up again with a new routine. Watch our Twitter feed, Pure Nonfiction, for updates. Thanks to our team, series producer, Michael Scotty Jr., sound mixer, Kyle Murphy, web designer, Cross Strategy, marketing coordinator, Sarah Modo, social media master, Jordan Smith, and executive producer, Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter, at T-H-O-M Powers. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.